Hello and welcome. He was one of the biggest movie stars of the last half of the 20th century. To put Charlton Heston's career in some contemporary context, he was the Arnold Schwarzenegger, or if you like, the Chris Hemsworth of the 1950s and 60s. Though it must be said, Heston's range of characters were far greater in more than 100 films he appeared in during a career that spanned six decades. From his Oscar-winning title role of Ben-Hur to playing Moses in The Ten Commandments and from his powerful performance in The Agony and the Ecstasy to his time-travelling astronaut in the original Planet of the Apes, Charlton Heston was truly a movie hero for the ages. But in 1981, at the age of 59, he was approached by his son Fraser to appear in an adventure film that Fraser had written set in the Canadian wilderness. The film was Motherlode, and co-starred Kim Basinger. Charlton played a crazy Scottish miner in search of his fortune. But shortly before shooting started, he found himself offered a further cinematic challenge. Did you uh, intend from the outset to both star in the film and to direct it? No, by no means. Uh, Fraser uh, wrote the script and about halfway through asked me how I felt about playing a Scot. And I said, well, I've played Macbeth five times. He said, no, no, I mean a modern Scot with a, with a Scots accent. And I said, well, I'll have to learn it. And then he, when he'd finished the script, um, he offered it to me as producer. And uh, I thought it was a marvelous part. And the idea of the Scot thing uh, intrigued me. And also the fact that it was kind of a dark, uh, not entirely a good guy, let's say, mm. uh, was something different for me. So I worked on the accent, and in, in the course of that, inevitably, I learned the part and had, you can't help planning how you're going to do it. So about a month or two after that, still well before the film was to begin, why he said, how would you feel about directing this? He said, you've really done most of your acting preparation. And he said, there are only five people in this, and you play two of them, so your communication with the actors will be <laughs> no problem, at least for those two. And he said, as far as communicating with the writer, that's me, and the producer, that's me too. And uh, he said, uh, when you're acting in the scenes, which is one of the main problems you have as a director, actor, and the, you know, to direct yourself, he said, I'll be there. And he said, I know the script because I wrote it, and I know your work. I've seen it all my life. And he said, I know what you want as a director because we've talked about it. Mm. And all that seemed to make sense. So uh, that was how I came to direct it as well. And it was, uh, you know, the fact that it was a, a modern story and I'd just done a period piece and the fact that it was an adventure piece and uh, with flying and explosions and things like that made it uh, an attractive undertaking for me and an well, interesting challenge. Did you have any second thoughts at all about, about moving into the director's chair as well? No. Uh, because when I directed Antony and Cleopatra, that was an enormously difficult piece to do, to act that and direct it, uh, compared to a modern story like Motherlode, was uh, much more difficult. But uh, having done it before and recognizing that uh, directing is the central creative part of film, there's no question. And it's something I'd always wanted to do again. But uh, I'd hesitated to do something quite as complex as Antony had turned out to be. And uh, Mother Lode's, as I said, is somewhat easier. Mm. And uh, also there were scenes in Mother Lode I wasn't in. And so that made it look a little bit lighter. And uh, uh, also the chance of uh, working with Frey as a, as a director uh, seemed to me a good idea and turned out in the event to, to work well. We. Uh, we communicated. Uh, see, directing is, is as much a question of communication as it is anything else. And the communication between actors, actor, director, uh, director, writer, producer, all those things have to work. And the more you can count on a successful experience in communication between two people, the better off you are. The fewer problems can come up. And uh, so that's, uh, it seemed to me, the, the right choice. And I think it was. And you, 
you of course have got Scottish ancestry, so you were on, yes. onto the mark sort of thing. But not, not really, it? not really. Uh, I'm not like Peter Ustinov, who can do those things like nothing. And my my grandparents on one side were Scots, but uh, they didn't have a pronounced Scots accent, and they have been a good many years dead in any event. Mm. And I worked with a with a coach that I'd used before for accents. I've done other accents, and. Uh, I kind of, uh, I, that was one of the important uh, attractions of the part for me, frankly. Mm. Uh, what, how long did it take you, in fact, to, to get the accent the way you wanted it? Well, I would say several weeks. Uh, not, I don't mean eight hours a day, but working on it uh, for an hour, maybe every day, for mm. several weeks. And then you let it cook overnight, you know, like, like studying anything else. And. Uh, you know, it took me uh, nearly two months to learn to drive the chariot and Ben Hur. These, <laughs> these, I, I don't learn anything quickly. <laughs> yeah. You've got two young stars in the film, of course, working with Nick you. Nick Mancuso and Kim Basinger. Yes. Where did they come into the film, and why Nick, who's emerging now as I think one of the bright young talents? When um, uh, this was, at, we cast uh, those parts after I had decided to direct the film, accepted Fraser's offer, and. Um, I had just seen Nick's work in Ticket to Heaven, which I believe is played out here, and is a remarkable, unhappily it wasn't a commercially successful film, but it was widely admired, and his performance in it was. And I think he's an immensely attractive young actor with uh, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of chemistry, a lot of fire in him. And uh, he looked plausible as a, a young bush pilot, a kind of... Uh, Kind of character who would get himself into the sort of trouble that the character in uh, in Motherload does, and he was uh, also physically a marvelous combination, I think, with Kim, who's uh, a spectacularly beautiful girl, and I think uh, also an interesting combination of uh, uh, vulnerable girl, and yet she's very gutty. She is in life, too. She's, uh, she stood up to some miserable physical conditions and working in cold water and in that mine and so forth and being dragged around. And uh, um, she, I saw her in, uh, in a film that I liked her in very much called uh, Hard Times. And uh, I I didn't see her. She's done some interesting work on television, which I hadn't seen at the mm. time. And, and you know, the usual way, you audition people and talk to them, and uh, uh, both of them seemed right. And I think they turned out. I'm very, very happy with what, what we got. And the film itself is shot, to, I think, mostly in Canada, isn't it? Yes, uh, all in Canada, yeah, all, all in, in British Canada. Columbia. Where, where are the uh, the exterior locations uh, of, of the gold mines north, and the mountains? Uh, in the Cassia Range, uh, along the west coast of British Columbia, going, uh, that's all that very spectacular country, some of the prettiest country in North America, I'd say. And very tough to work in. The Those glacier lakes and the, um, the rainforest, um, which uh, is spectacular to photograph, but is indeed a rainforest, and you get a lot of rain in it. <laughs> and that made it uh, very difficult. And we were shooting just a little later than this time last year, when the weather is starting to turn towards winter. Your uh, autumn. Yes, the, the, the northern autumn. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were uh, squeaking it very close to get uh, to the interior scenes before the weather went. Now I understand, I don't know whether this is true, but I'm sure you'll be able to put us right, that uh, one sequence in the film uh, early on with the plane was completely unintentional. The, the crash, yes. That, uh, I don't think you could pay a pilot to crash a plane like that. <laughs> Fortunately, he uh, walked away from it with only a little cut in his shoulder. And it, of course, makes a spectacular scene. Uh, he was supposed to be landing in this mountain lake. Uh, we were shooting in a, one of those glacier lakes up in the Cassiers uh, that is, can only be gotten into with a plane, a float plane or a helicopter. And uh, we were shooting there, and uh, Joe Kanat, who directed the action sequences, was directing that shot. And he had two cameras on it, and the plane came in as it had landed several times that day perfectly and the toe of the float caught and it just as you if you've seen the film it just somersaults and it's just a horrifying looking crash but uh, uh, Fraser 
said, uh, we've got to rewrite the script. He said, I'll get at it right now. And uh, fortunately, it, we hadn't shot the sequences that involved the plane later. So he was able to uh, simply say that they crashed in the lake instead of landing on it, which then that means they're trapped. So that's, uh, in a sense, better. Mm. And it, uh, the later scenes with the sunken plane are visually more interesting than if the plane had just been sitting there well, on the Well, that adds to the tension sure, of the whole it's thing. it's much more interesting. Yeah. So we were very lucky with that. It's sometimes accidents uh, can just ruin everything and mm. sometimes they turn film is uh, is that way it's a very volatile medium you learn things about a script that you cannot discover in a typewriter you've got to be on the ground where you're shooting before you will learn everything there is to find well, out. It was pretty pretty rocky ground they're looking at some of those mountains. Oh boy, things. Terrible yeah. really any, rough. Any, any accidents there or mishaps at all? The usual stuff we didn't have uh, uh, anything as bad as that, uh, the, the plane crash, mm -hmm. but uh, we had uh, in some of the explosions, uh, some, uh, some of our stuntmen doubling were, you know, shaken up, but mm -hmm. uh, nothing that they weren't prepared to deal with. Mm -hmm. It's uh, that too, the, the, the handling of that kind of thing is highly technical and depends on using people that really know what they're doing. We had uh, a special effects man that Joe Cannot, who directed, as I said, our action stuff, persuaded to come out of retirement, a man named Joe Day, who is one of the best special effects men in films. And he, as an old friend of Joe's father, came out and did this for us and did the mother load, the water bursting through and, uh, and the explosions and designed uh, uh, equipment that would make it possible to shoot them. And I'm I'm just delighted. I, I can boast about that stuff because I didn't direct it. And it's, how, uh, how much of that stuff is, particularly down in the mine, which is is quite amazing, mm -hmm. is, is actually in a mine or there? That's what the whole on a the interior of the mine we built entirely. If you think about it a moment, you'd realize you can't get mm -hmm. cameras down a real tunnel of as narrow as that. It just would be impossible, and you couldn't light it if you did. Mm -hmm. But uh, our production designer, who I think deserves enormous credit, a designer named Doug Higgins, uh, designed that set. We found we needed a huge space for it. We found an abandoned factory that had made suspension bridges. You can imagine how big it would be. Mm. And we rented it for really very little money and used 44,000 square feet of it to put the mindset in, all these tunnels and pitfalls and rocks and slides and everything, and pools. And um, then there was still four-fifths of the factory standing empty. Over in a corner about a block away, there were 50 buses <laughs> stored, really. <laughs> Amazing, yeah. Well, it has come together very, very well. Has the film been released in the Yes, market? it's opened in the States, happily, uh, very successfully. And we took it to the Deauville Festival um, 10 days ago, where it was also very successful. And it's just opened in uh, France, is about to open, I think it will open in Sweden, uh, just about the same time it opens here in Australia. And uh, we're... Uh, Looking forward with eager anticipation to see uh, if Australian audiences welcome it as warmly as I, it has I been elsewhere. I think they will. I hope so. I'm I'm I hope sure so. Can, can we can we go back a little bit and talk yeah. a little bit more generally about about films? Uh, you've said since you've been here that a friend of uh, yourself and you sat down one day and, and just went through the budget on Ben Hur if you were mm -hmm. to make it today. Yeah. Um, and you came up with some pretty startling figures. What? Is it possible to make such a you film can't, like that? No, I don't think so. Ben Hur today, according to this production manager friend of mine who budgets films for a living, he did a rough estimate. He said Ben Hur would cost a hundred million to make today, and you can't conceivably release a film that you, you can't mm. spend that kind of money on a film. And uh, it's it's too bad. I think uh, films of that kind would. Uh, please audiences now as much as they did then. Mm. Uh, they release Ben-Hur every so often in theaters at, in various places and it always seems to the chariot race still <laughs> still works. Do, does it 
does it frustrate you at all if you, if you think about it that despite the number of films that you've made and the range of characters spanning literally thousands of years, I mean going yes. right back into the Old Testament and right into the future, that people still associate you with the biblical epics or the epics from ancient history? No, not really. I think, uh, you know, you can be grateful they remember anything you've done. <laughs> and, <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll settle for that, and uh, that they give you a chance to uh, try something else. That's I couldn't ask for uh, for more from an audience. You, you said once that uh, you know people people look at uh, the big epics and they they tend to dismiss them. And you said I think in an interview it was around about 1960, if I remember rightly, that uh, that it's far harder to make an impression in an epic than it would be in a smaller budget film. And I think you used the film uh, Room at the Top as a, as a kind of a comparison. It was a greater challenge for you to play, say, Moses or Ben-Hur. Well, uh, obviously, I think I mentioned Room at the Top because it came out the same mm. year Ben-Hur did, uh, and indeed uh, shared in the Academy Awards. Simone Signore won for Best Actress. And uh, what I meant was it's, I think, more difficult to make a performance register effectively in a story where you're uh, surrounded by uh, the Great London Fire or the the Black Death or the the American Revolution or something or the fall of Rome, uh, if you've got uh, a big physical event, uh, you have to spend, a, especially in an historical picture, you've got to send, spend a certain amount of your screen time setting up where everybody was and whose side you're supposed to be on and introducing all the different characters and uh, then showing how it was that San Francisco was destroyed in the earthquake or whatever you're telling them about. Mm. And uh, to make a performance register in what is inevitably limited time uh, and uh, competing with thousands of screaming extras waving torches or whatever they're doing is uh, presents special problems. Mm. But uh, uh, obviously the kind of uh, marvelous performances that both Signore and uh, Larry Harvey gave in Room at the Top is the work of gifted artists, mm. there's no mm. question. On El Cid, did, was, was that a film that you had any regrets about making at all? Not at all. Um, I'd like to make it again. I could do it better. <laughs> I think uh, El Cid was uh, in some ways one of the most successful, uh, perhaps physically the most impressive in terms of the look of it, uh, of those big uh, historic epics. Uh, it didn't succeed perhaps as well as Weiler did with Ben-Hur in conveying the people, but I think uh, the story is in fact a better story than Ben-Hur. El Cid was after all a real person. The, he's, he genuinely was a great figure in Spanish history. And uh, I've often thought that I would like to have seen what William Wyler would have done with that story. Mm. The, what what are, of, of El Cid was, were the things that you kind of remember from it? I mean, the things that stay in your mind? Well, the character himself, uh, I've played maybe, what, uh, a dozen or fifteen uh, historical figures, biographical films. Mm. And I find them very interesting to play. Uh, to play a real person is uh, presents a special kind of an acting challenge, of course. And El Cid, uh, especially the fact that he aged through the film, uh, was uh, an interesting thing uh, as an actor. Uh, perhaps, you know, if I'm playing Ben Hur, I can really use myself, and because it's a fictional character. Uh, when you're playing Andrew Jackson or Cardinal Richelieu or The Seed, mm -hmm. you have to try and sort out the kind of man he really was. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the most interesting part of, uh, of doing that picture, that you were exploring as best you could uh, the life of a man who had genuinely been an extraordinary human being, mm -hmm. who's, uh, who did leave a mark. Uh, all the way across the centuries from 1050. And in fact still today still does, in, yeah. in Spain. Oh yes, yeah. the Cid is uh, one of the great national heroes uh, not only in Spain but really in all the Latin American countries. Mm -hmm.
Can we go forward? I mean, forward in terms of the kind of films that you've done, um, uh, uh, futuristic specifically. Uh, Soylent Green, which tended to get, uh, if I remember rightly, uh, criticism for being a slightly too heavy look at what it was all about. And of course, Planet of the Apes, which was a marvelous yes. film, and still we're going to be showing it shortly. Yes, I think Planet of the Apes, I suppose, was the first of the science fiction future space travel films that were still up to, uh, were still awash in them. And that was, I suppose, the first. Um, it worked well. We were, uh, we were pretty certain it would succeed commercially. It was pleasant that it was generally critically admired, too. Uh, we didn't think it would perhaps be quite as successful as it was, but again, we were the first in a line that is still uh, very, very popular. Um, I liked Soylent Green. Uh, I think the chance, uh, the acting relationship with Eddie Robinson was uh, very rewarding. It was his last performance yeah. and uh, very, very moving one it was. He was dying at the time. I was going to ask, did you know yeah. that he no, was No, we didn't know that. He did. And I think I've often felt that his death scene which was in fact the last day's work he did in the picture and thus the last acting he ever did in his life uh, was as poignant as it was because of what he must have been thinking about its mm. importance as the last acting he would do. And he never betrayed the fact to people no, around no, him? No, 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 no. He was perfect. He was uh, in good spirits and seemed uh, certainly enough energy for the performance. He was seemed a bit tired much of the time, but he was mm. not a young man, and we assumed that would be reasonable. But uh, he was very careful not to let anyone know, mm. I think. Uh, and, of course, that's the choice anyone would make. Uh, but it was... Uh, I've always remembered that, uh, that... I think the film, as you say, is... Uh, a kind of a dark film, a little cold maybe, mm. but uh, I think it's relieved because of the warmth of his character. Yeah. And my character, Thorne, is by intent uh, a man who has no understanding of the past that Robinson remembers and no particular... Uh, he's a, an alienated character who is to a certain extent redeemed by Robinson, but yeah. uh, it, uh, the Eddie's character is really the pivot for all this to work, and I think it, uh, it, it does work in those terms. Apart from an extraordinary movie career, Charlton Heston also had an extensive television career, including appearances in the famous American soaps Dallas and the Colbys. He was always an activist who switched from the Democrats to the Republican Party and earned the ire of millions of his fans worldwide with a dogged pro-gun stance, including serving several terms as president of the notorious National Rifle Association. And, by the way, a bit of personal trivia, and perhaps a nice familial twist, his son Fraser had co-starred with Dad as Baby Moses in the Ten Commandments. <laughs> 